Here we're going to look at the activity series, which is used to predict if single displacement reactions will occur. As a reminder, a single displacement reaction is when you have some sort of couple, typically an ionic compound, but not always. So I'm just going to use some generic notation here. So I have A and B, and they're together. Maybe it's silver nitrate or something like that. Then you have another single. I'll just represent it by letter C, but it doesn't mean anything. It's not carbon. It's just generic element. And C is trying to kick A out of its relationship with B. So C would come in and, you know, bye-bye A. I want to hook up with B. So if this happens, then they're going to rearrange and we're going to get C with B. They're together now. And poor A then got kicked out and A is now by itself. So that's a single displacement reaction. However, does C have enough power, enough activity to kick out A? That's the big question. So when we go over to the activity series, and again, I know I've talked about it a little bit, everything in my head is like some kind of novella, some kind of grand soap opera. So to me, C is like the Sancho who's trying to kick A out and hook up with B. Oh, it's very dramatic. Um, very scandalous. So I like to think of this as a table of who's got game. So who has enough appeal to do what C just did? Because, you know, not every person can come in and be like, hey, I get what I want, right? So this is a a table of who's got game. So lithium and potassium, they can always come in because they're at the top and they can do what C just did. They can come in and, and break up, destroy couples. But when we get down here, platinum and gold and mercury and silver, they're never going to be able to come in. They're basically, if they start at singles, they're going to be single for life. They can't come in and kick out um, anybody. So down here we have like, you know, like our, our poor guy down here that, you know, doesn't look too good for them in terms of relationships. Um, okay. So all joking aside, and, and this is seriously how I think about it. I'm like, Ooh, lithium, be careful there. Um, but all joking aside, we're looking at the ease at which an oxidation reaction occurs. So for instance, with lithium, an oxidation is lost. Let me write that down real quick, and we'll do lithium as an example. So you start with a lithium solid, and we know from the periodic table that it likes to form a plus one ion. Ions are always aqueous, and that goes across the board for all types of reactions. And then when it turns into plus one, right, because over here it would be zero, and over here its oxidation number is plus one. So that means it lost one electron. So we're going to put this one electron over here. So what this is saying is that lithium readily loses an electron, which then enables it to hook up with the other one. Gold and platinum and silver. And you're like, why are you putting the sad face? I like gold. I like my silver. These guys are super stable. So they don't undergo these oxidation reactions. And that's actually what makes them very uh, valuable to us for, you know, different purposes, copper pipes, jewelry, um, um, pots and pans are made out of copper. So even though I put the sad face, 
they don't undergo oxidation under most conditions. It's difficult, which makes them, we can call them non-reactive, we can call them stable, but at the end of the day, that also makes them very valuable to us because of their lack of reactivity. All right. Um, the last thing I want to say is you don't ever have to memorize an oxidation table or an activity series. This type of information is always provided. The one part that you will see, depending on what kind of activity series you're looking at, there's a lot of different versions out there. Um, they may or may not include the charges on the ions. So the one on your handout states that lithium turns into a plus one or zinc turns into a plus two. But a lot of these you know just from working your reactions or looking at the group of the periodic table. So magnesium is in group two, so even without that information, a student would be able to write, oh, it's gonna turn into magnesium two plus. It went from zero to plus two, so that means it lost two electrons. Alrighty, let's look at some examples. So we want to identify who's going to displace who. So in this first example, gold can potentially come in. If something was going to happen, it would be displacing the silver. So a pattern that you're going to see a lot is the metal potentially displacing the metal. Now we got to see if it's going to happen. So gold is down here, all the way at the bottom, and silver is pretty low, but silver is higher than gold. And so that means silver has more gain and isn't going to be displaced by gold. Gold isn't powerful enough, gold doesn't have enough activity to break up this relationship. So this one's going to be a no reaction kind of situation. On our second example, we're looking at zinc and mercury. Your table doesn't have mercury, but I looked it up and it would be between our silver and our platinum. So mercury is all the way down here, kind of on the low end of things. And zinc is much higher. So zinc has a lot more gain, zinc has a lot more activity than mercury, which means unfortunately for mercury, zinc can come in and kick mercury out of its relationship. So now we actually have a relationship and we need to, or a reaction, and we need to analyze it. So mercury, if we look at this and break it into ions because it's aqueous, we can predict a plus two charge on mercury, and that's gonna come from undoing the crisscross. This two originally belonged to mercury. And then the nitrate, we know from memorizing our polyatomic ions, that the nitrate is NO3 minus. Zinc, either looking it up on the table or just remembering because it's one of those um, constant charges, zinc does a plus two. So now mercury leaves, sayonara, and we got zinc and nitrate hooking up. So we're gonna have to redo that crisscross somewhere. So we have zinc two plus and NO3 minus. And so I'd bring the two to the outside. And so we're gonna have Zn NO32. Our solubility rules, yeah, we still gotta use them. Our solubility rules tell us that nitrates are always soluble. So I'll label this as being aqueous. And then the thing that gets kicked out, 
actually gains electrons and becomes um, elemental again. So I wanted to say solid. Most of them do become solid, but I'm looking at one of the weird ones, right? Mercury, we know, is a liquid at room temperature. So that one actually becomes just HG liquid. But again, most of them are going to turn into solid. Neutral, no charge. Um, you always have to check that it's balanced. This one does happen to be balanced. Next one, aluminum and copper. So let's rank everyone. Aluminum is here and copper is lower. So aluminum does have the ability, since it's ranked higher, to kick copper out of its relationship. So let's analyze it since we know it's going to happen. So this two originally belonged to copper, so I know copper is going to do a two plus ion. I brought this two back up. It doesn't belong to chloride anymore. Chloride is a Cl minus. In essence, you're undoing your crisscross, right? The two went back up here and the one went back up here. But no subscript anymore. You're undoing your crisscross. Aluminum, we know from experience, does a three plus. So now, aluminum is going to hook up with chloride, and copper is going to be the single. So I need to redo the crisscross positive always first, and I'll bring down the three. So I have AlCl3, that's going to be aqueous per my solubility rule. And the guy that gets kicked out is always going to turn back into um, an elemental metal. So we just wind up with solid copper. An elemental neutral metal. All right, one more to go. Uh, this one's a little bit different because typically we have a, a lot of the examples, you'll see a metal try to kick out a metal. But hydrogen is also one of the species on the list. So we want to see if hydrogen, or the other way around, we want to see if gold can kick hydrogen out of its relationship with chloride. So gold would have to have more activity, more gain, in order to break up this relationship. Gold is all the way on the bottom. That's not going to happen because hydrogen has more gain than gold, has more activity than gold. So that one's not going to happen which is actually really good news because that means that if you're working with an acid, and remember, this is hydrochloric acid, but you're, there's also acids in things like pickles and ketchup. So if you expose your jewelry to your gold jewelry to an acid, it's not going to undergo a reaction. It's not going to start breaking apart on you. It's pretty um, safe in the presence of an acid. 